You could think that in some sense you just own yourself, you know. It's your life, it's your body, you're yours to do what you will with. And if that was true, well then it would seem to me that life would be a lot more straightforward because you would just tell yourself things that you would instantly obey and believe. So first of all, you'd tell yourself all the things that you were going to do and then you'd just run off and do them, which you don't, obviously because it's much more difficult than that. And then you'd also say, well, enough of the guilt and the shame and the negative emotion and the disillusionment and the vengefulness and all those things that make life hard, especially the self-recrimination. It's like, what the hell do we need that for? And if we're our masters of our own destiny and owners of our own fate, then why can't we just command to ourselves that that be dispensed with? And like, that doesn't work. I've never seen anybody able to do that. So, I mean, you can fool yourself for very brief periods of time into thinking that that might work, but but it doesn't work, and, and that's strange. And this is one of the reasons I love the psychoanalysts, say, because they were really the people, apart from the religious types, who figured out that whatever you are, you're not a unitary spirit that's under your own dominion. Your attention, for example, is mediated by unconscious forces. And you know that, you know that perfectly well, and this is another Freudian observation. You know, if you're sitting down to study, for example, your conscious intent is to study, but you know perfectly well that all sorts of distraction fantasies are going to enter the theater of your imagination non-stop and annoyingly, and, and there isn't really a lot you can do about that except maybe wait it out. You know, so you'll be sitting there reading and your attention will flicker away. You'll think about, oh, I don't know, maybe you want to watch Jane the Virgin on Netflix or something like that, or maybe it's time to have a peanut butter sandwich, or you should get the dust bunnies from un out from underneath the bed, or it's time to go outside and have a cigarette, or maybe it's time for a cup of coffee, or it's like all these subsystems in you that would like something aren't very happy just to sit there while you read this thing that you're actually bored by, and so they pop up and try to take control of your perceptions and your actions non-stop. Maybe you think, well, this is a stupid course anyways, why do I have to read this damn paper, and what am I doing in university, and what's the point of life? It's like, you can really, well, you can really get going if you're trying to avoid doing your homework, and, and, and then you might think, well, what is it in you that's trying to avoid? Because after all, you took the damn course and you told yourself to sit down. Why don't you listen? Well, because you're, you're a mess. That's basically why. You, you haven't got control over yourself at all. And no more than I have control over this laptop. <laughs> okay, so there's the memory function of, of, of the unconscious, and there's the dis dissolutive function, that's an interesting one. The unconscious contains habits, once voluntary, now automatized, and dissociated elements of the personality, which may lead a parasitic existence. That's an interesting one. I would relate that more to procedural memory. You know, so what you've done is practice certain habits, whatever they might be, let's call them bad habits, and you like those things to get under control, but you can't. So maybe when you're speaking, for example, you use like and you know, and you say um a lot. And you've practiced that, so you're really good at it, and you'd like to stop it, but you don't get to, because you've built that little machine right into your being, right? It's neurologically wired, and it's not under conscious control, and anything you practice becomes that. It becomes part of you, and, and that's another element of the unconscious, a different part. And then there's a creative part, which is that, well, you know, you're sitting around and maybe you're trying to write something, or maybe you want to uh, produce a piece of art or a piece of music, or maybe you're just laying in bed dreaming, and you have all these weird ideas, and especially in dreams. It's like, what, where do those things come from? And even more strange, one of the things that's really weird about dreams, and almost impossibly weird, is that you're an observer in the dream. It's like a dream is something that happens to you. Well, you're dreaming it, theoretically, so how is it that you can be an observer? It's almost like you're watching a video game or a movie, but you're producing it, at, at least in principle, although the psychoanalysts would say, well, no, not exactly, your ego isn't producing it, your unconscious is producing it, it's a different thing. It's a different thing, and of course Jung would say, well, it's deeper than that. The collective unconscious might be producing it. It's in some sense, it isn't you exactly, or it isn't the you that you think of when you think of you. And that's the ego from the Freudian perspective, the you that you identify with, that's the ego. And outside of that is the unconscious. The id, 
that's more the place of impulses and you could think about those as the biological subsystems that can derail your thinking right and that govern things like hunger and sex and aggression and your basic instincts is another way of putting it and it's a reasonable way of thinking about it because these are subsystems that you share with with animals you share them certainly with mammals you share most of them with reptiles you share a lot of them with amphibians and even going all the way down to crustaceans there's commonality for example in the dominance hierarchy circuits and so these are very very old things and the idea that you're in control of them is well you're not exactly in control of them and I would say the less integrated you are the less you're in control of them and the more they're in control of you and that can get really out of hand you know uh, you can be like with people who have obsessive compulsive disorder for example which 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 is which seems to be I would say the dissolutive elements in some sense of the unconscious the way that it's portrayed here poor people with obsessive compulsive disorder they can spend half their time doing things that they can't really control and they have very strong impulses to do them and it's very hard on them to block them you know they they'll almost panic if those things are blocked and then you have people with Tourette's syndrome you know that they'll be doing all sorts of weird dances and and spouting off obscenities and 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 imitating people without being able to control it and and sometimes a little bit of antipsychotic medication can dampen that down but it's as if there are these autonomous semi spirits inside of them that grip control over their behavior and make them do things and you know you find that to some degree in your own life because maybe you've become very attracted to someone even maybe you don't want to be attracted to the person and then you find yourself you know texting them when you know perfectly well that you should be going to bed and you know you're you're in a grip of something and and you can't control it and that's all part of the unconscious and all part of what freud was studying now freud established the field of psychoanalysis and and with it investigation i would say rigorous investigation into the contents of the unconscious a modern psychologist and psychiatrist like to what would you say denigrate freud but, uh, and I think there's a reason for that. I think that Freud's fundamental insights were so profound and so valuable that they got immediately absorbed into our culture. And now they seem self-evident. And so that all that's left of Freud is his errors. You know, because we, we believe everything else. We believe all the profound things he discovered. We just take them for granted. And so we don't believe the things that he said that weren't quite on the money. And that's all we credit with him with now. But he was certainly the first person who brought up the idea of the unconscious in a in a rigorous manner and he was the first person to do a rigorous examination of dreams because the interpretation of dreams is a great book it's well worth reading and he was the first person to note that people were in some sense inhabited by sub personalities that had a certain degree of autonomy and 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 independent life psychoanalysis is i would say a romantic school of thought and the reason for that is that for psychoanalysts emotion and motivation are far more important than rationality and I would like to point out that that's true it's, it's not a theory we know a lot more about the limitations of rationality now partly because of our explorations of artificial intelligence than we did 120 years ago when the psychoanalysts started their theorizing you can't think without motivation and emotion in fact you can't think without a body and even if you had a body you couldn't think without the surrounding social world and so for the psychoanalysts and this is also true of thinkers like Nietzsche you make sense out of the world because you're boxed in by society and then you're boxed in by your body and then you're boxed in by your motivations and emotions and then only inside that circumscribed space can your rationality operate and part of the reason for that is that most of the world is technically uncomputable so for example if you play chess here's an example the fastest supercomputer ever invented cannot calculate all the permutations in a single chess game if it ran from the beginning of time till now and that's just a chess game and so what happens is that every action you take 
has consequences and then those consequences have consequences and those consequences of the consequences have consequences and you can't compute your way through life. We orient ourselves through life by mechanisms we really don't understand. And the psychoanalysts figured that out from a quasi-scientific pers perspective before anyone else. Another way you can think about that is that for centuries or for thousands of years or maybe since the beginning of human consciousness, it was accepted as universal wisdom that human beings were the pawns of the gods, we might say. And these were, at minimum, causal forces with personality that operated behind the scenes and whose essential motivations were mysterious to us. Now, modern people no longer believe that, but the psychoanalysts began their theorizing from that fundamental perspective. Even Freud, who portrayed himself as rationally anti-religious, merely replaced religious notions with notions like the superego or the id. Now, he localized them inside, but whether the gods are inside or outside makes very little difference to whether or not there are gods. Now, what the psychoanalysts offered us that no other school of psychology has managed so far is the notion that human beings are basically a loose collection of spirits instead of entities that are transparent to themselves and primary ra primarily rational for the psychoanalyst you're like a room full of ghosts and you, the, th the you that you think you are, might be one ghost among all those ghosts and it even might think that it's the ghost in charge but the probability that the part about being in charge is true is zero. It's simply not the case. And one of the other things that the psychoanalysts have to offer, which neither the cognitive science, scientists nor the, even the emotional neuroscientists have realized, is that the structures through which we look at the world and also the structures that motivate us are actually alive. We don't have mechanical cognitions. What we have is what we are is a sequence of embodiment by different motivated spirits. And you know that perfectly well if you watch yourself behave over a two-week period. You're a different person when you're angry. You're a different person when you're afraid. You're a different person when you argue with someone you love. You're a different person when you're confused. You know, you're a different person when you're egotistical. You're a different person when you're wrong. And it takes a tremendous amount of psychological development before there's any coherence across those multiple selves except the coherence of memory and post hoc rationalization. You have fragments of yourself within you that are like low resolution representations of you, you know? And the and the psychoanalysts would think of those more as they're kinda like they're kinda like one eyed giants. That might be a way of thinking about it if you were thinking about it in a fantastical way. So there's the angry you. And you know, you've all come in contact with the angry you. It's uh, rather rigid, that's the first thing you might say about it. It's impulsive and short term. It doesn't think much about the past, unless it's bad things about whoever you're angry at, in which case it thinks about them a lot. It's not too concerned with long term future consequences, and mostly it wants to be right. And, you know, when angry you disappears and Normal you, assuming such a thing exists, reappears, you can be perfectly shocked about how angry you behaved. And in fact, sometimes, if angry you really gets out of hand, like it might in a battle, in a war, it might do things that you just can't imagine that you would do. And under those circumstances, you can reveal parts of yourself to yourself that are so foreign and so horrifying that it will leave you with post-traumatic stress disorder. Because it is the case that many, but not all, people who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, especially if it's battlefield related, get it because of something they did 
rather than something they saw or something that happened to them. And that's really worth thinking about, you know. We have to figure out how to take all those underlying animalistic motivations and emotions and civilize them in some way so that we can all live in the same general territory without tearing each other to shreds, which is maybe the default position of both chimpanzee and humanity. You know, so, so I take that seriously, the idea that we're a loose collection of spirits. And that, that, uh, that, that you know, it says in the Old Testament somewhere that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I think this is akin to that. If you know that you're not in control of yourself thoroughly, and that there are other factors behind the scenes, like the Greeks thought that human beings were the playthings of the gods. That's the way they conceptualized the world. And they sort of meant the same thing. They meant that there are these great forces that, that move us, that we don't create, that we're, that, we're, that we're subordinate to in some sense. Not entirely, but we can be subordinate to them. And they move our destinies. That was the Greek view. And there's something, it, 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 it teaches you humility to understand that, that, that there's a hell of a lot more going on behind the scenes. And you're, you're the driver of a very complex vehicle, but you don't understand the vehicle very well. And it's got its own motivations and methods. And sometimes you think it's doing something, and it's doing something completely completely different. You see that in psychotherapy all the time because, you know, you help someone unwind a pattern of behavior that they've manifested forever. First of all, they describe it, then they become aware of it, then maybe they start to see what the cause is. They had no idea why they were acting like that. You know, they have to have the memory that produced the, the, the behavioral pattern to begin with. It has to be brought back to mind and then it has to be analyzed and assessed and then they have to think about a different way of acting and it's extraordinarily complex. So the psychoanalytic perspective is that people are inhabited by multiple spirits and they are not clearly the masters in their own houses. And, and as far as I'm concerned, to not believe that is mere naivety. It seems to me, especially for, as a consequence of thinking it, of it for so long, that it's self-evidently true and that if people merely meditate on that in their own life for any period of time, they can understand that very rapidly. You're not a unity. And those subpersonalities have their basis in, well, in all sorts of things. They, they might have their basis in past, especially traumatic experience, or in patterns of socialization that characterized your family. But they might also have their basis in fundamental biological motivational systems. So, for example, a psychoanalyst would conceptualize anger or, or perhaps sexual attraction as a subpersonality. And the reason for that is that well, you know what it's like when you get angry? If you get angry at someone you love and, you know, first of all, you, you know, at, at some level you're wishing harm. Now, that might only be that you want to win the argument and you want them to be nicely crushed while you do it. But so, so there's a desire that comes along with the anger. But, it, but there's a lot of other things that happen too. So, for example, if someone's annoying you, even if you love them, the probability that at that moment you're going to be able to easily access all the memories you have about how annoying they are and have difficult time accessing the memories about how wonderful they've been to you is quite high. You know, and you know that because sometimes you get angry with someone and you have an argument with them and you sort of clue in later. You snap out of your more or less possessed state and you think... Yeah, well, you know, I really wasn't taking the context into mind, and I was kind of harsh. So, well, so, and so then you think, well, who's in control? And that's the question the psychoanalysts are really interested in, and their answer is, it's not generally you. And so it's very terrifying reading in some sense, because, you know, people like to think of themselves as masters of their own house, so to speak, and it's just, it's only vaguely true. And, you know, people... You know that too, because you make maybe New Year's Eve, uh, what do you call those, resolutions, how you're going to be a better person. I think one of the most common ones is, man, you're going to hit the gym three times a week. It's like, no, you're not, actually. And so very few people do, and that's partly because, well, it's hard, and so you don't want to do hard things, and what they aren't, the reason for that is because they're hard, so it doesn't take much explanation. But it's also because you can't just tell yourself what to do. 
And that's annoying too, because life would be a lot easier if you could just say, okay, well, you know, sit down, study for two hours, don't watch cats on YouTube or whatever it is that you're watching. And no, 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 that isn't what happens. You sit there and you study for a while and then, you know, you're thinking about cats and the next thing you know, you're watching haunted mansions in London or some damn thing, you know. So, so and it's a scary idea in some sense because... If you think, well, if you're not really master of your own house, you know, if you don't have yourself under full voluntary control, and you certainly don't, then what does? And, you know, Freud is interesting in that regard because he really talked about the motive power of fundamental motivational systems. Mostly for Freud, it was aggression and sexuality, you know, and those are, those are big motivators. Let's make no mistake about it. And so he thought of you as, as uh, that the conscious part of your personality maybe as the... Yeah, it's, it's like the captain of a ship with a very unruly crew. It's a nice metaphor because, of course, a ship's on the ocean and the ocean can be very stormy and so you can only sort of plot your course and you have to work with what's thrown at you and then the unruly crew is, well, it's all your drives. It, drives is the wrong way of thinking about it. The, I like the psychoanalytic notion of subpersonality because a subpersonality has a viewpoint. There's things it wants and it plans. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's a living entity. It's not some dead cognitive system, you know. So Freud was interested in some sense more about, I would say, the biological underpinnings of the subpersonalities, you know, because he was, he was, he was quite biologically oriented and, and he realized that sexuality and aggression were very fundamental subpersonalities. And then there's Jung, and Jung is much more terrifying than Freud, which is really saying a lot because Freud's quite terrifying. But Jung, he, he's just terrifying beyond belief. And, you know, for Jung, the sub-personalities that make you up are thousands and thousands of years old. They're cultural constructions that are thousands and thousands of years old. And they have you in their grip. So for Jung, for example, one of the things he said, and I don't remember where it was, I love this phrase, it's so true. And you can think about this for like five years. And, and you can still think about it after that. One of the things Jung said was that people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. And that's really something to think about. Because, you know, just think about your own situation. So, no doubt you have political views. And you think, I have political views. It's like, well, no, you don't. Because you share them with a lot of other people. So they're certainly not yours. And not only that, they've had a very lengthy historical development far before you ever showed up, you know, so they're rooted... It, they're rooted right at the depths of your culture, but then, of course, they've been elaborated by one philosopher or another extensively over the last two or three hundred years, and there's this whole system of thought, and poof, it inhabits your brain, and then you think, well, I've got political views. It's like, no, the political views have you, and that's a very salutary thought, because it's one of the ways to stop yourself from being possessed, because... People get possessed all the time by ideas, right? That's what happened in Nazi Germany. That's what happened in the Soviet Union. It happens everywhere all the time. And you might think, well, possessed is a little strong, but, but no, it's not, actually. It's a very nice, it's a metaphor, obviously, but it's the right kind of metaphor because a body of ideas, like political ideas, they're a living thing, you know? They're not, they're not some dead dusty words on a bookshelf somewhere. They're an integral part of a dynamic society. And, and the motive force those ideas have motivates you. You're in their grip. And so you can tell when you're talking to someone who's completely possessed by, a, by an idea system or an ideological system because they'll just bore you to death unless you happen to believe exactly the same thing. So they'll spout out a few of their fundamental belief axioms and then you can identify which system they're part of and then they just speak in cliches from that point onward and you can predict everything you're, they're going to say if you know the axioms of the system. So it's very, it's very non-authentic speech and that would be a way that, say, someone like Rogers or, or, or Abraham Maslow, who were humanists of the 1960s, might talk about it. Because the person isn't speaking from the depths of their own experience or from even their embodied knowledge. You know, they're just mouthpieces for abstract ideas. And so it's very frightening to realize the extent to which you can be the mouthpiece for abstract ideas, you know. And it's actually one of the dangers of becoming educated, especially in a mass system like the university system, because a lot of what happens to you when you come to university is that you're fed a set of 
pre-digested ideas. I suppose that's one way of thinking about it, you know. And it's very easy for you to think, well, that those are now your ideas. They're not. They're not. Lots of ideas you have to earn. And if it's a great idea, then you really have to earn it. Because why should you just be able to come along and, like, pluck up a great idea? That's not how things work. You have to earn things that are valuable. So anyways, the depth psychologists, man, they're so good at that. It's lovely to read them. And the problem, too, is with a lot of the people we're going to talk about, it's very difficult to summarize their work. You know, because often the devil's in the details. So, you know, you might look at someone like Piaget is a good example, the constructivist that we talked about briefly. Man, the guy wrote dozens of books. You can't just summarize those suckers. It's not one coherent theory that you can boil down to, you know, ten axioms and then you can read it while you're flying from Toronto to Montreal and poof, you're a Piagetian psychologist. Like, it, it doesn't work like that. The people who, may, who formulated these theories were extremely intelligent and, and, and they were often great writers. And so a lot of the knowledge is actually in the writing itself and not in what you can extract out from the gist, you know. And most of the theorists, Freud, Jung it's harder, but Freud, Rogers, people like that, you can extract out the gist of their theories and then you can, uh, what would you say? You can, you can stereotype it or you can caricature it and then you can point out how your caricature is absurd and then you can feel like you're even smarter than Freud. And, you know, you're not. So it's not a good idea. And so these people should also be approached with respect because, man, they have so much to tell you. It's so useful.